Yes, sorry, I did. I just let the video on in all at once. Sorry. Open it. Like yeah, makes sense. All at once. Go for it. A deluge of participants is presumably the uh, collective noun. Uh, a, a wash, a tidal wave. Oh, I like that. A tsunami. <laughs> that sounds a bit disastrous, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Right, OK, so I think that's most. Are there more people waiting here? Yeah? No. OK, so hello again to everyone returning for oh, we've got even more people admit. Perfect. So yes, so hello again to everyone returning for this, the third session of MMU's Gothic Approaches and to everyone joining for the first time. Welcome to Irish Gothic on St Paddy's Day 2022. Perfect timing, right? I am Oliver Rendell and I'm here to reintroduce this series before passing on to Kate, uh, tonight's chair. So if I could ask everyone again to keep your mics and cameras turned off, uh, just for the duration of the papers at least, uh, that'd be great. But please put all your comments and questions in the chat and uh, our chair for tonight, which I believe is Fred, will be picking up on them. We're going to be recording the event for tonight, so just to let you know, it's make it available on the Centre for Gothic Studies new YouTube channel. And if uh, you missed our first session, it's already online and the second one will be soon. Uh, big thanks to Zavi for getting that all worked out. Once again, I'd like to thank Manchester Centre for Gothic Studies for enabling the, web the webinar series. For those that don't know, uh, since 2013, MMU Gothic has been organising postgraduate studies at MA and PhD level. Anyone keen to get more involved with the centre, the Modern and Contemporary Gothic Reading Group is now being put together as we speak and the schedule will be available soon. Uh, once more, Manchester University Press is uh, supporting the event by providing a 30% discount, uh, which you can get using the code that's in the chat already. I believe Fred's already put that in. And we'll add it again at the end of the event so you don't have to, you know, crawl through all the questions and comments and everything. Uh, Gothic Approaches itself is organised by current PhD students at MMU, which is myself, Teresa Fitzpatrick, Kate Maloney on the screen now, Frederick Blank and Alicia Christina Edwards. Uh, with it, we aim to showcase the diversity of Gothic research now underway at MMU. Each session will offer two papers on a complementary theme that the speakers will address for 20 minutes each. Uh, the next session, in fact, will be on Gothic occultures, and the page is live on Eventbrite now. Uh, I think, Fred, if you could put that in the chat, that'd be great. Questions will be taken at the end of the session and picked up along the way by our moderator. Or if you're comfortable switching on your camera, you can ask your question yourself, but keep it to the end. However, please do write all your questions in the chat first so we can have a record of them afterwards. That's that'd be brilliant. Tonight's session is titled Irish Gothic, and our speakers will be discussing questions of female identities in Gothic texts relating to female identities. And so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Kate. Hi, thanks, Ollie. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with Kirsten, who is going to be delivering a paper entitled The Cycle, Feminist Power, Agency and Othering in Historical and Contemporary Witchcraft. Um, Kirsten is a devotee of the Gothic and is the author of three novels, The House of Ursuli, which is with Shade Mountain Press, Ice Song and Tattoo, both which are with Del Rey. According to Forward Reviews, Kirsten makes the macabre beautiful. She lives in San Diego, California, where she teaches creative writing and literature at two universities. And I invite Kirsten to come on up so she can deliver her paper. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to screen share so that we can view my presentation. Oh, give me just a second. Mm. 
Um, hang on a minute, sorry. Ah, uh, there we go. All right. All right, thank you very much for joining. I am going to be talking about Alice Kittler. I do apologize, Kirsten. We can't see your screen. Um, can you see it now? Oh, I can see your wonderful face. Alas, I cannot see your slides. I'm not sure. Would you like me to share my copy? Up and you tell me when to move, if that works. Uh, I believe I've. Okay, I'm just going to interject. So no, there's a there's a make little. Make sure you have. So Kirsten, just make sure you have your PowerPoint open, and then when you click the little rectangle with the arrow in it, make sure that you select the PowerPoint, the screen with the PowerPoint on it, and hopefully that should work again. You did it earlier, yeah. so it should work. Trying to get it set up. I'm getting some pushback from my laptop and some security issues. So let me try once again, and then if we can't get it, um, Kate, if you would please pull it up, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think perhaps it's easiest for you to do it. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please don't worry, in true Gothic fashion, your PowerPoint is both there and not there. <laughs> Bring it up. Well, um, my work is all about interstitial and liminal spaces, and that's where my PowerPoint resides this morning. Perfect. <laughs> um, I'm going to put it up now, and if you okay. tell me when to move, and I will hopefully do that on time for you. All right, marvellous. Is it showing OK? Yes, yeah. yes, it's great. Thank you. Fabulous. Go forth. <laughs> right. So as I was saying, uh, my work, uh, one of the chapters of the project that I'm focusing on uh, the cycle is on Alice Kittler, who was the first woman uh, accused of witchcraft in Ireland. Um, and so we're going to be exploring the three faces of her experience and to understand whether she is a witch, a black widow, or a scapegoat. Can you turn, please? Next slide. Thank you. So a brief introduction to my research and my project. Uh, a celebration of feminist agency, my work rebukes cultural constraints that disempower and vilify self-actualized women. Comprising two companion texts, a novel and a critical thesis, the cycle incorporates prose, verse, and illustrations. It begins in the pre-pottery Neolithic period and ends in the present, and there are 21 interlocking chapters which follow the transmigrated soul of a witch through the stages of the triune goddess, maiden mother crone, and stages of dormancy and reincarnation. I call this the four stages of the feminine power cycle, and it examines how witches acquire, process, manifest, and disperse or transfer power. In the novel, the witch is reborn across the globe and time, gaining knowledge, tools, and talismans while learning how to manipulate the elements as her power grows. Historical events and figures in folklore and mythology, including Alice Kittler, the first woman tried for witchcraft in 14th century Ireland, inspire this work. My critical thesis details the research and scholarship supporting the novel's epistemological functions. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. 
So to construct a visual representation of these principles, I charted them. The three faces of the triple goddess and the four stages of power align with a number of things, including biological stages of womanhood, adolescence, fertility, and motherhood, uh, fertility or motherhood, and menopause. It aligns with directional energy, the seasons, and the three forms of magic. And if you can look in the chart, I've just explored uh, a little bit how this is, um, how I align these concepts. So in metaphysics, there is a theory about how energy travels through the body. So it comes in the left hand, uh, moves through the body and goes out the right. And so that's what the arrows indicate. And then in the stage of dormancy or death, the energy recharges for its next cycle of growth. And then you can see different iterations of the stages and how they um, pertain to uh, Stephen Cartman's drama triangle and the empowerment dynamic, among others. Uh, would you turn the slide, please? So I call this mad, uh, the cosmic rule of threes. And what I describe as the cosmic rule of threes is a prism that refracts itself in new iterations across different schools of thought and systems of belief. Magic resides in liminal spaces. Consider it the dark matter between the stars. These interstitial spaces are where I direct my gaze to discover hidden connections, stories, and truths. Energy follows thought, and energy itself is a neutral force. Energy, by any other name, is power. Energy follows thoughts, and thoughts create emotional response. Thought plus emotion equals manifestation. This is the total law of creation. And we might use these terms interchangeably when talking about electricity or an accusation of witchcraft. It is a quantitative property that must be transferred to a body or physical system to be effective. Next slide. So returning to the three forms of magic and how they align with the stages of the Triune Goddess, they can be distinguished as transcendence, transformation, and transaction, what we define today as the triple helix of magic, religion, and science. This is also the fundamental premise of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, thoughts, feelings, and behavior, which is uh, significant in accusations of witchcraft um, in some ways that we'll explore later. It's also evident in Stephen Cartman's drama triangle, the empowerment dynamic, personal pronouns of selfhood, me, myself, and I, the triple goddess, and most significantly, the Christian Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And this is especially important in discussions of witchcraft because satanic witchcraft is invoked and conceptualized as a heretical inversion of this Christian Trinity. Okay, next slide. So to explore why women are accused of witchcraft, it's primarily women in history, although uh, many men have also been accused as well as um, more, more recently non-binary people. To take an intersectional approach allows us to identify the real source of these accusations an intersectional approach examines the historical records, political and ecumenical trends, and cultural values to identify how accusations of witchcraft were shaped by a combination of social factors such as gender, race, class, age, and so on. These interconnected social factors create a unique experience of power, <clears throat> privilege, discrimination, and oppression. In Kittler's case, we must consider the factors that conspired against her. Gender disparity and misogyny. Her economic status and class. She was a wealthy merchant class. She was also considered uh, somewhat of a foreigner because she was Flemish. And religious and political tension. Bishop Ladred, who was enthralled to his patron, 
Pope John XXII, who had a deathly fear of sorcery, capitalized on continental European trends to import the idea of satanic witchcraft with the intent of destroying Hitler to earn political favor and advance his career. Next slide. It's easy to identify Alice Kittler as a mother in this cycle. And a cycle has no beginning and no ending. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's with us always endlessly moving and changing form, entering, inhabiting, and departing a living vessel and leaving decay in its wake. Energy is the powerful elemental force that animates our universe and everything it contains. Why would we not want to reach into the ether and pluck a strand of it for ourselves? To direct or dam its flow and apply it to our own purposes. But how does one harness the invisible, shape it to fit our whims and desires or ride its stream? As one does a skiff upon the waves. Energy, magic, is the enduring currency of our species, and so we spend it, hoard it, earn it, or steal it with intense, benign, or nefarious. We might think of it as a sort of psychic coin purse carried throughout the energetic rotations of our reincarnations through lifetimes of penury or wealth. Next slide, please. So it's interesting to think about energy as magic magic as power and power as wealth. And that is the root of the Kittler case. We can take three approaches to examining her case. Is she a black widow? Is she a scapegoat of the system? Or was she actually a witch, a self-identified witch? So it's interesting to note that in these discussions of historical witchcraft, uh, there are very few self-identified witches in the actual trial records. Um, those came about through confession, um, the self-identification. Otherwise, being labeled a witch is always an assigned identity, assigned by the accusers. So Alice Kittler as Black Widow, a bit of history on her case. In 1324, Kilkenny was the capital city of Norman Ireland. Though beholden to English rule of law, Ireland pro proved mostly immune to the demonic witchcraft hysteria sweeping England and the European continent. Records count no more than four executions of accused witches in Ireland's history, compared to England's approximate total of 500. Yet the familiar demons of patriarchal misogyny and classism were hard at work snaring Alice in a thorny tangle of family allegiances and political machinations. Accused, jailed, and tried on hearsay evidence of sorcery and heresy, the wealthy Dame Kittler slipped the figurative noose and vanished, never to be seen or heard from again, which simply means she no longer appeared in the historical record. It is suggested she fled to England or Flanders after her trial, but there's no record of her after that disappearance. Perhaps she leapt astride her, broomst her broomstick and flew off into the cold black night, laughing all the while. Her story remains unique because of this vanishing. The witch of Kilkenny never burned. Instead, she fed to the fire her 24-year-old servant, Petronilla de Meath. Persons accused of witchcraft were typically impoverished, meddlesome, ill, elderly, or demented. Without connections, political influence, or the wealth to flee capture, as Alice did, these unlucky souls hanged and burned in town squares. Sacrificial scapegoats who sated public outcry for justice and retribution. And in a final classist power move worthy of a crone, Hitler transferred the stigma of her crimes to the younger Demeath, allowing her proxy to suffer the, in the punishments intended for her. Next slide. Four times married, the contemporary supposition is that Hitler was a black widow who amassed her wealth by killing off her husbands. Uh, someone, we assume that it was perhaps Petronilla de Meath, suggested to her husband, the knight Sir John Lepore, that Alice's 
malefic deeds, her witchcraft caused his wasting disease. Uh, however, it's, you know, there's plenty of other reasons why he might have died, why all of these husbands might have died, but the commonality is that they were all married to Alice. So uh, in Kittler's case, the mother energy manifests as a crude financial health that she earned through her marriages to William Outlaw, banker Adam LeBlund, a landowner Richard DeVal, and uh, finally the knight LePoer. The early demise of serial widow Kittler's husbands suggests a familiar trope in contemporary pop culture, the gold digging black widow. TV Tropes describes her as the man-eater, a woman whose husbands and love interests keep on dying. Usually she is a cross between a con artist and a serial killer, a woman who seduces, marries, and then murders men for money. Next slide. Or was Alice Kittler actually a witch? After a sack full of horrible and testable things was found secreted in her rooms, seven charges were brought against Alice Kittler and her associates by um, Richard Ledred. So the sack full of horrible things could have been innocent. It could have been uh, an, any number of things, herbs, uh, keepsakes, but it was used, it was weaponized and used against her. The charges against her were denying Christ in the church, cutting up animals and scattering the pieces at a crossroads as an offering to a demon, stealing the church keys to hold meetings at night, brewing potions in the skull of a robber to incite people to love, hate, kill, and afflict Christians. Uh, she had a demon incubus for whom she received her wealth and permitted herself to be known carnally by him. Next slide, please. She was also charged with using sorcery to murder her husbands and infatuate others to give their possessions to Alice and her son, uh, William Outlaw, thus impoverishing her stepchildren, who accused her of poisoning her fourth husband, Sir John the Poor. Because it was believed uh, that witches needed to prey vampire-like on the forces of non-witches, it becomes relatively easy to cast Alice Kittler as a villainous witch who preyed on her husbands and stepchildren. It's also evident that regardless of her actions or intentions, Alice was caught in the crossfire of Bishop Ledred's political aspirations, family tensions with her stepchildren, and a lawsuit against her stepson, Richard Laval, and the satanic witchcraft machine. Was she a victim of the patriarchy, a convenient scapegoat, a powerful woman who must be hobbled? Next slide. If we examine her as a scapegoat, it shifts the dynamic of her whole case. People who accused women of witchcraft and put them on trial, tortured, banished, or executed them, explained these reasons by appeal to religious beliefs. But those beliefs, according to many current theories, were external trappings for other social, political, and economic agendas. Writing in Psychic Power and Soul Consciousness, Cora Deaver explains it thusly. The devil and the dark forces are intangible, unseen enemies that are impossible to grapple with in open combat. So fear of the unseen becomes transferred to things that can be seen, human beings themselves. For the masses, this approach focused anxiety. It provided an explanation for misery and took people's minds off their trouble. And for the clerical elite, it served to validate the authority and structure of their society and the misogyny towards women. Uh, because of the unanticipated side effect of legal reform, uh, the, sorry, the unanticipated side effect of legal reform was the creation of a judicial apparatus conducive to witch hunting. And so both the masses and elites found their search for scapegoats effect efficaciously challenged. Next slide. 
So this brings us to how the chapter on Alice Kittler fits into the Irish Gothic. So every chapter in my cycle, the novel, uh, and in the textual analysis, the critical work embraces specific theories and conventions of the Gothic, offering a holistic analysis of its cultural significance and artistic import. So writing in The Emergence of Irish Gothic Fiction, uh, Killeen says, Canon canonical texts of the Irish Gothic were produced in the white heat of Irish history, and they're marked by an ambivalent dialogue between Catholophobia and Catholophilia, progressivism and nostalgia, the future and the past, English rationalism and Irish atavism. In Alice Kittler's chapter, I sought to invoke a traditional folkloric voice and the avant-garde, the experimental ethos of James Joyce, Ireland's preeminent modernist author. I approach this by disrupting narrative linearity and exploding form to better visually indicate relationships between Kittler, Petronilla de Meath, and Richard Ledred, the Archbishop of Ossory. With an intention to analyze the frictive religious ideologies of the Middle Ages, using contemporary poetic approaches to text and the page, along with language extracted from these historical texts and court records, I spotlight the areas of confluence between these three characters, the intersection of accusation. And here is an excerpt of that work in progress. So I've taken their three approaches and used them to create three separate narratives. So Alice is on the left and she says, my first husband gave me a son. I let him live, but no more were we got, and so I slew him. My second husband refused to lie with me, and no more sons begot. He took his pleasures in my maid's quim, so with a grin I slew him. My third husband called me lamb, and sweet by to wee, and I would have kept him, but for the fever sent him mad. I couldn't bear to see him wane, so I walked him down the graveyard lane and bid him lay and rest and left him lame. My fourth husband, now he's the one who pulled all the lacings of my lies undone, said I spoiled the butter and my son and said, oh, what a cruel woman you've become. If I am made horrid, so shall I become horrid. Bind dead men's nails and cock and trails, the hairs and shrouds, of boys yet unbaptized, horrible things in a horrible stew, spiced with incantations to cause Lepore, number four, to lose his natural senses and give all his coins to me. In the center, we have the narrative of Petronilla de Meath. And because her voice is absent from so much of the dialogue about the Kittler case, uh, the text is recessed on the page and basically breaks down into a few keywords. Hearsay, I hearsay, her say, heresy, torture, tore her, open. Petronilla is the one that actually burned for Alice's crimes, not Alice. And so she descends into the fire. Fi, 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 amen is the chant that Alice was said to say, her demonic chant. And on the right, I have the narrative of the bishop, Alice William R. Artisan, that is the name of her familiar, Robin Artisan. Outlaws three, face seven charges against thee. Children made poor, fairy stricken and sorcery, polluting throats and mouths with secular songs, carousing with a dreadful nest of heretics, theft of lands, maleficum, causing violence and harm, crimes of womanhood, sins all, by decree of the careerist money-grubbing Bishop Leatherhead. And then uh, I've taken, within this text, I've taken lines of the historical record and quotes from each of the speakers. So, um, Bishop Ledred was actually issued an edict about not singing secular songs because they polluted throat and mouths. And Alice was accused of uh, being a, the controller of a dreadful nest of heretics and so forth. So I pulled from them and Lepore was uh, lost his natural senses when he became ill. 
All right, next slide, please. So to conclude, in well-documented and researched cases like Alice Kittler's, I investigate what is unsaid to reframe the experience of accused witches and shift our gaze toward latent possibilities. By synthesizing and presenting this necessary information in a new way, I hope that my projects inspire reverence and horror by acknowledging witches and witchcraft as foundational sources of spiritual and metaphysical expression. These texts re-envision witchcraft as a pro-social expression of personal power and contribute to current conversations about individual and feminist agency, institutionalized othering, and persecution in patriarchal societies. The cycle attempts to encapsulate these mythical transformations within its pages, such as the nature of grimoires to charm and conquer the demons who foment the unhappiest of human experiences and to offer the reader magical tools that will allow them to conquer the unconquerable. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was a really interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to talking to you a bit later about the creative process and, uh, and everybody's questions uh, in the chat. So I would like to invite Esther to join us, please. If Esther remains here. I am I indeed am. here. Yeah. Fabulous. Uh, so to introduce Esther, Esther's presentation is The Song of the Banshee, Voicing Trauma in Historical Gothic Fiction. And Esther has worked as an English teacher for many years, also working in theatre and producing performances of new writing. She's currently writing a historical Gothic novel about the relationship between a young woman and a banshee. And her PhD thesis addresses the challenges inherent in writing the contrasting narrative voices. Esther, over to you. Okay, I'm just gonna share this screen. Can you let me know if that's actually working? Hopefully you can see it. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, okay, fantastic. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be talking about um, my, uh, the creation of voice really in my novel. Um, the Song of the Banshee. I mean, that's a working title. It's not necessarily going to be called that. Um, and it's a novel about the relationship between a banshee figure um, and a young woman. And it's set in Dublin, period 1916 to 1922, um, the establishment of the Irish Free State. Um, I will be talking about this concept of trying to voice trauma in, in this historical Gothic fiction. Um, and sort of giving you a bit of an example of how I do that maybe at the end as well. Um, so the concepts in here, um, folklore and the Gothic, female histories, um, different aspects of trauma, post-colonialism and creative reimaginings. Okay. So the first thing um, that I wanted to ask myself really is what is a banshee? Um, we've probably all got a kind of image of maybe the screaming banshee that you can see in the picture on the left here. Um, Patricia Lysett, who is a well-known Irish folklorist, describes a banshee as a supernatural death messenger, which I think is a really good way of um, describing a banshee, um, because a banshee will appear um, just before someone is about to die. They appear to family, close family, friends, maybe even neighbours, so in folklore, um, they can appear in a number of um, different forms. So they can be witch-like. Um, so you get that sort of impression from the kind of um, witchy expression, the, the dark hair, um, quite often gray hair and actually quite often long hair rather than short hair um, as in this picture. Um, and witch-like in, in the sense of an old crone as well. Um, but you also get the kind of um, reverse, if you like, so the opposite um, version of womanhood um, in that she can appear as goddess-like, um, which sort of relates back to um, Irish mythology. Um, you can see in the sort of left-hand picture here, um, depictions of beautiful, tall, blonde-haired goddess-type figures 
And these women populated the underworld, sorry, the other world. They're very similar concepts, though, in the sense that the other world in Irish mythology um, is a place where uh, people go when they die. Um, so they're sort of goddess like figures who would welcome somebody who's died to the other world. So there's these different types of um, sort of manifestations, if you like. There's also another type of um, banshee that can appear who looks like a washerwoman. Um, typically kind of after a battle, it will be the sort of blood soaked clothes of a soldier um, and she'll be seen washing them by the roadside. Um, and it will give people a foreboding of a particular person's death. Um, and so, um, uh, probably one of the sort of most famous um, ideas about a banshee is the sort of oral manifestation. So the wailing or screeching, um, weeping and crying that could be heard um, from this creature. In fact, they don't really say anything. Um, they don't particularly have a voice as such, or certainly they don't speak in a language that we can understand. Um, but they have this very sort of... Um, piercing sort of shriek. Um, they are positioned in a sort of liminal way as a lot of spectral um, ghosts and um, beings in, in the Gothic are. Um, Banshee would be sitting on a fence perhaps or small enough sometimes to sit on a window ledge and scrape her fingernails down the window pane. Um, never coming into the house always in a sort of borderland um, and she'll she'll never sort of encroach into the house but there's the threat of that. Um, there are various different legends that are associated with the Banshee. Um, one of them is known as the legend of the comb um, and the Banshee has something in common with um, other you know mythical creatures from um, the sort of other world um, in that she combs her hair. She's often seen combing her hair, um, people who have claimed to have seen her. Um, she has long hair and it's usually really messy. And so she, she combs these tresses. Um, and the comb is really significant. If you steal a comb from a banshee, I um, don't know if anyone ever has, um, then she will chase you. Um, and the only way that you can pass the comb back to her is with a pair of iron tongs through a window. Um, uh, because the iron um, is magical and will um, protect you from her um, evil touch. The other thing about um, a banshee um, is that she is a solitary being. So it's only sort of in literary interventions where we see that she's presented perhaps with a whole host of other banshees, maybe singing or playing the harp or um, something a bit more benign than, than perhaps uh, what we're used to associating with the banshee. But really in terms of folklore, um, uh, she, she tends to appear on her own. The other key thing about Banshee is that um, apparently she follows certain families, um, you know, and there are the Banshee myths and families go up to today. So people will talk about um, a Banshee, perhaps who is connected to their family in some way or stories um, from the past um, about a Banshee. Um, and there's a sort of sense of um, pride, perhaps, in the fact that a banshee might follow a traditional Irish family. So an authentic Irish family, a noble Irish family, um, people who can trace their ancestry right back um, to, uh, you know, the 8th century, maybe before that. Um, so this idea that um, the banshee will follow your family if you are truly an Irish family is, is really the idea behind that. Um, something that I started to look at um, was really how um, the Banshee is represented and also what does the Banshee sort of symbolise and there's this idea of um, the sort of trauma of women really um, and this idea of that women that are always left sort of dealing with the trauma of, of loss um, after battles um, you know, Ireland's been invaded by all sorts of different people, the Vikings, uh, the Anglo-Normans in the 12th century, um, Cromwell in the uh, 17th century. Um, so there's, there's an awful lot of um, personal and communal loss um, to be dealt with. And death was something that women 
traditionally were um, tasked with dealing with, cleaning the bodies um, and then performing rites. So this is where I think sort of the origins of the Ban Banshee myth seem to come from, as well as sort of being connected to this idea of um, the women of the other world and, and um, the sort of deathly associations of that. Um, there's also the, fe the Irish female tradition of keening. Um, and the difference between uh, a keener, I suppose, who is um, tasked with mourning the passing of a, a, you know, an important figure in the community and the banshee is that the banshee has no voice. Whereas the, the keeners, the keening women really did. And a uh, book talks about them being lament poets, that they were able to use their verbal skills um, they had traditional meter verbal formulas. Um, they used this song and, and poetry to lavishly praise a dead person's character. And these figures are, uh, of the keeners, um, they could be actually related to the dead person or keeners could be paid professional mourners. And yes, they would weep and wail, which is something that they have in common with banshees. Um, but they also have this um, incredible sort of um, articulate um, side to, to the rituals. Um, and wakes and rituals, um, you know, wouldn't necessarily be sort of solemn affairs. Yes, you would have the wailing, the weeping and poetry and song, but there'd also be um, uh, dance, there'd also be um, sort of almost like more of a festival sort of appreciation of the sort of cycle of life and, and birth and death and so on. And within this kind of um, sphere, there was female agency. Um, these women had power within the community. And there's a sense in which there's sort of, there's a resistance there as well, because women might not also, they might not only say something um, sort of positive about the person who's passed, they might also be criticizing the person and talking about their failings and faults. Um, and this is an interesting sort of area and a, and a sort of sphere in which women could sort of um, demonstrate resistance against the patriarchy. Um, what I find quite interesting is that following the Cromwell's invasion in the 17th and 18th centuries, you have a sort of rise in the records of the Banshee myth and a lot of interest sort of in it in a literary sense as well. And uh, during that time, the church had put a ban on keening. Um, and, and keening still happened and still happened up until 20th century, but it, it, it wasn't meant to. And so I think, you know, there is a connection here um, with the mute voice appearing in, in the Banshee myth, you know, that she can't speak. She's, she's been told not to speak. She no longer has agency. Um, someone's trying to move, remove her voice. Um, so I think it's an interesting idea, um, but also how the Banshee myth persists. And that says something to me about the power of women's stories. And, and she starts to become this quite powerful um, figure in female agency and resistance for me, uh, which I found uh, quite interesting the more I looked into it. Um, we've also got the question of sort of colonial trauma and how um, the Banshee sort of is representative in this arena as well. So um, uh, I'm particularly concerned with the sort of um, British occupation, if you like, and um, the sort of colonisation um, by uh, that started with um, the Cromwellian invasion, or you could argue with the Anglo-Normans earlier on. And there was a colonial threat at this point to Irish national identities. And you could say that the Banshee becomes a trauma response to the death and bloodshed and famine um, that, that follows. Um, the Banshee figure, um, as I say, starts to become quite well reported in, in sort of literature and different interventions and versions of the Banshee are appearing. And this seems to be, say to me, it's a sort of, uh, she's becoming a symbol of resistance and Irishness that you can't really have a banshee in your family if you're not truly Irish. So to make us, uh, to, to create that identity and to hold on to that identity and to um, talk about sovereignty, um, you know, the, the idea of um, a female figure or goddess of sovereignty that kind of um, rules over female territories, um, even era is quite often 
um, uh, you know, the symbol of Ireland is, is, is this goddess-like figure. Um, and if the Banshee is related to that idea of territories as well and claiming territories, it's quite significant as a, thing, uh, as a figure of resistance. Um, <clears throat> so Scanlon and Kumar say that falling prey to British imperialism, the Irish nation was effectively silenced as a post-colonial possession for centuries. So this idea that, um, you know, the Banshee is a figure that has been muted, that she, that she doesn't have a voice. And that the scream that she has becomes perhaps a grieving and searching in this post-traumatic state from some kind of truth or deliverance from the colonizing power. Um, and in my book, the Banshee, um, her life sort of spans um, over centuries. Um, she's not always present and she appears at various points um, sort of uh, supporting the family that she is following. So she's able to witness um, these different events. Um, so she becomes um, uh, an important figure in kind of telling some histories from a, from a female perspective. She's bearing witness to the traumatic events. I like the idea of a sort of Gothic or folkloric figure um, to be the witness. Um, as Fel Felman says, truth does not belong to the speaker, the listener, or the empirical material world. So I like the fact that she's not quite real, she's not quite material. And even though I'm giving her a voice, um, she's also got this sort of spectral quality about her. Um, so a lot of what I'm writing about is um, in my thesis is about how to create the voice of this traumatized other. Um, and I looked at sort of different sort of literary cues, really, to kind of inform uh, the style that I'm experimenting with. Um, and it's very much sort of in a draft process at the moment. Um, but I looked at Les Murray's animal poems because I felt there was something, there's something half human about her. She is an anthropomorph anthropomorphic figure, but also because she doesn't have words. Um, you know, how, how am I going to make her have words? How am I going to allow her to have words? Um, she has to perhaps speak in a slightly different way. Um, so I looked at these animal poems that uh, Les Murray writes from the perspective of animals and the trauma that perhaps they suffer at the hands of humans. So I've kind of tried to take some of those ideas um, as inspiration for this. I'm also looking at, um, you know, um, a more modernist approach, a stream of consciousness, perhaps um, McBride's style in a girl is a half formed thing. There's some stream of consciousness there. Um, and we're getting some sort of poetic and lyrical forms coming into this as well. Um, and I did start off thinking, you know, this Banshee, she's, she seems to be this, this character who's a victim that she's sort of suffering constantly. But, but again, I'm sort of tr trying to sort of bring out the kind of resistance side of it as well. Um, Another aspect that I'm trying to work with is this idea of creating a voice of a monstrous other. And um, it's well documented that a monstrous other in the Gothic can be used as a societal critique. Um, for example, monstrous figures trouble binaries and undermine stable hierarchies. And, you know, it's probably quite obvious to refer to Frankenstein um, in that respect. So I've also written some passages where the Banshee um, is an aggressor or an avenger. Um, I've also used some hybridization and shape-shifting as well. Um, and that's not traditionally associated with the Banshee um, myth. Um, but if we go back further into mythology, um, there are various witch-like characters um, and also battle crow type characters. Um, and I thought, actually, it's an interesting idea to maybe allow her to um, shapeshift. So there's a bit of a sort of creative intervention there, really. Um, and in a moment, I'm just going to read um, a short extract, sort of five minute extract um, from a section of the, her story um, where she has just transformed from um, a young woman, a sort of more goddess like version. Um, of the Banshee um, into, uh, she transforms into um, a more um, 
creature-based, bird-like um, manifestation. Um, okay, so I shall share this with you now. At the beginning of this, she is in a more human form and she's in a forest. Crack of twig, horses hooves and men not far away. Come not near me, I cry, but mouth won't move, lips stuck shut, only weeping, only tears. Come not near me, I try once more. No sound of words, but they must see the fear in my eyes through the glimmering dark. From a distance across the stream they stare, muttering in low voice. Hooves stutter back and forth, brushing, snorting. Animals stock still, move no further. Voices mutter. These men, I know them, jump and scuff. They're off the horses, lanterns lit, held high, gleaming in the water. I cringe into the shadows. This is no place for a young woman on her own at night, says the tall one. I know that accent. I want to say, what difference does it make? Your child is dead, the one you never knew, nothing about, whatever. Since when did you give? But no sound comes, not a whisper, only tears. Stop, I say. Go back inside my eyes. Shut down my heart. My body trembles. Face leaks the tears of a thousand widows. She's a pretty young thing, says the companion. I want to hiss, scratch, warn him off, but only tears and whimpering and whining. The tall one says, a weeping woman on her own in the woods. I've heard of such things. She's doubtless a witch. Prettiest witch I ever saw, says the other, and he's climbing into the stream. Still I weep. She's a harbinger, I'm sure of it, tall says. Lover of mine, if only you knew. He's straining to see me, holding the lantern high. There's one way to find out, says the other, into the water, through the trickling stream, closer and closer. I see the whites of his eyes now, glaring at me from the water's edge. And I weep, these tears still coming, still falling. I want to say, keep away. I've had enough of men to last ten lifetimes. Keep away from me. I'm none of your godforsaken business, except your friend's child is dead. And so are you, if you take one more step. He takes another step, stinks of ale, wide grin, not many teeth. I shrink behind the tree. He grabs my waist and pulls me towards him. Don't touch her, cries the tall. Grinning man drops his lantern now, smashes on the rough ground. Flame trips along the leaves and lights the trees. Horror now I see in tall, one of the tall one's eyes. Horse whinnies. Man lunges, takes me by the waist. I'm corporeal. I feel his fingers on me, see me reflected in his eyes, see the flame in me. I can't speak, but I am strong. You have to stop, man shouts. I grind my teeth, the skin wrinkles in the wink of an eye. Flames split and crack on dry wood. Mare stamp feet, knuckles split through fair skin, eyes bulge in their sockets. Lips split and crack and teeth go sharp. Hair withers to a crisp. Red eyes aflame. I fly at him. Mouth gaping with a shriek of seabirds. He ducks back. I scratch his face with my claws. Razor sharp. He's groveling in the mire as I streak off into the night. Hag breath satiated. Matted locks unfurled. Claws curled. Hair on end. What was soft flesh is gnarled as a tree stump. I flap over treetops. Night sounds come to me as whispers, distorted echoes, mystical hymns. Below is stretched the bogland, clumps of woodland here and there, moonbeams filtering through blackest cloud, spider crawling, tiny tarsus on twig. Schwum, schwum, tack, tack. Wolf howl, far off. We run with you, fairy of the mound. Squawk of crows. Crack crow, crack crow. Rush of icy air, throat dry, sinking now, rain pattering, losing height. Wolf call, more distant this time. Black land stretched to black cloud on the sinewy horizon, like an old hag like me. Bony artery of tree stump and dry logs for limbs. Watery moon hanging like a single dragon's eye, losing height. There is a heart thumping, slow, arrhythmic. I flap. Can't hold the weight of my carcass body. Pull down, pull down to the black earth, the sodden night earth of the bogland. What am I? Hag? 
crow, gull. I have a beak that's certain some wings, mainly bone and sinew, few dark tawny feathers, tufts, some skin too, stretched across a bony frame, rattling breath, breasts shrunken and shriveled, claws for nails. But as I land, I'm standing, no, bent double, but not entirely bird. Mouth of dirt and feathers and meat, death rattles in my throat. Have I eaten? Maybe a mole, a mouse, a bat, not enough water. Droplets of rain glisten like tiny mirrors on my leathery skin. I lick it off, frog-tongued. Not enough water through the ground is sodden. Fall to my knees, yes I have them, and grovel in the bog, swilling the earth like a pig. Shuffle, grunt, splutter, lids drooping, weary, back breaks. Webbed fingers grip the rushes, cracked lips sucking up the roots. The earth ascends, rising to a lump, a clod, a mound. My sea-racked carcass hauls up the grassy mound, dig deep clawed fists, bat wings sliding in the sod, beak and mouth chewing dirt. Lizard scutters over my leathery skin, his scaly eye winks. I slip out of bog bean soup onto cotton grasses, ferns, bracken, a dry spot, body of lead. Face up to the black sky, no fleck of star, no little star shining through, where's my child? No human can live here, only a witch like me. Black is my heart. I'm sorry, God. Every sinew of my rotten bones cries for my sins to be cursed like this. You're stronger than you know, says a voice so small it's not there. A world snail creeps across my brow as the turf pillow slowly opens as if to swallow me whole into its depths. Body contorts, shrinks and merges with soil. Earth covering face, beak mouth. No more black sky. Just clods in my eyes, clogging my bat ears, my mouth, my throat, ribs dissolving into soil, becoming the earth. You're with us now, Wolf now speaks. No more breaths, just clag. Sphagnum moss growing in my veins, buried alive like the roots of a silver birch. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Esther. It was really great to hear a segment of your work in progress. Um, I would like to invite Kirsten to come back. Um, we have Fred here joining us. Fred is manning the chat um, and he will be delivering um, any questions that come forth. Um, Firstly, I wanted to say thank you both so much. They were really interesting presentations and both very different ways of looking at the Irish Gothic and the female within the Irish Gothic and actually quite complimentary. Um, oh, yes, I agree. Kyla is commenting on oh some fabulous language use that you had there, Esther. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I, I kind of wanted to start with one of my own quite selfishly. Um, both of you chose to look at a more historical period um, in terms of Ireland and the history of Ireland. I wanted to ask what was your thinking behind it? Why did you choose the particular periods that you did? Um, either to start, please. OK, well, I, I suppose I can answer that in the sense that um, I started off wanting to write something that was based on my grandmother's experience because she was she was born in 1914 in Dublin and I always thought that her story was really fascinating because she grew up there through the troubles um interesting experience um then came over to England and was a nurse during the blitz and she just went through this whole sort of raft of experiences and I thought it would be fascinating to, to write something that was based on that. However, obviously, it's completely changed because she wasn't a banshee. So, <laughs> so you know, it's it's not it's very loosely based on that now. But that's where I started. It was in that period, and then I started looking around that period and thinking, well, what would happen? What could happen in this space? So it was place and time really that was the sort of beginning for the process. Yeah. 
So I ended up choosing Alice Kittler because, you know, she, her her story is so unique and different, and it really highlights some of the issues in um, the witch craze, you know, the this political and religious tensions. And that period in the, you know, early 14th century is especially significant because it, it kind of is the first groundswell of, of the wave that would come later in the UK and spread around the world to um, take the lives of so many people. And she's also interesting because, you know, a lot of people are captivated by her story. And so, you know, there are films and songs and all kinds of different interpretations of her story. But I wanted to explore it in a different way and look at what are the um, what are the implications of her if we look at her as a victim and a scapegoat? How does her story change if we acknowledge perhaps she really is a black widow or, you know, taking these different approaches to analyze it? Um, and so she just seems like a, a great one to break open because we don't hear her voice a lot. We hear the voice of the people around her. Brilliant, thank you. Um, kind of bouncing off what both of you kind of hinted at a little bit, um, These both of these works are a work in progress as far as I'm to understand that it's still changing and developing. I just wanted to ask how has it changed from what you had right at the beginning, your grand ideas, and to what it is now? How is it metamorphosed into what it looks like these days? <laughs> oh gosh, I, I, it's a really difficult question for, for, from my perspective. Um, I think it's interesting how research really informs what you do creatively and then vice versa. Because I suppose I would always with the creative writing PhD, I'd always want to start with the with the writing, but then obviously you need something to base it on. So, you know, the way that they talk to each other is really interesting. But um, I think the thing that's probably changed the most is asking a question of myself about this, about authenticity and about how I can talk about othering um, when I'm somebody from a sort of privileged group. And um, I think that's been a really important question for me to ask myself about how that works. So I think what really happened was I started to develop now um, two different voices really um, for the, the novel. The Banshee really is, is a sort of internal narrative within a wider frame because it's the young woman who um, really, it's her story um, and she is actually writing the Banshee's narrative. So the question of who is the other becomes quite significant um, to the text. And spoiler alert, uh, by the end of the book, you realise that the person who's really narrating this is the real Banshee. So I wanted to kind of um, try to <clears throat> explore this idea of, of otherness and what do we assume about the other? So I've created a voice there with the Banshee that you heard. Um, it's a creation based on this idea of what otherness might be and what a non-standard narrative voice might sound like. However, I was very aware of the fact that that's just from my perspective. So I wanted to turn it on its head um, and sort of explore it in a different way in the narrative structure. Um, yeah, so that's something that's changed. For me, it's constantly changing. This whole idea that I initially started with, it felt like I went fishing for a kraken and I <laughs> caught one and I've like hauled it up and every day I am wrestling with it on the decks of my ship, you know, and it's always changing and, and bringing in new ideas and concepts and ways of approaching the material and you know, what I go into it thinking I'm going to do or find is often changed or confronted or um, 
reconfigured by what I discover in the research and the new patterns that emerge from that. So I know that, you know, I have my original conception, then I have the work in progress. And I also know that once both works are complete, I will see something, you know, entirely new and different that will have to shift my approach again and make me go back in. And so a lot of it is discovery. It, it's really just um, being open and attentive to what arises and then looking at those patterns and, and trying to see um, how they work both creatively and um, as, a, as a research source analytically. I think we have a question from Theresa, who's uh, has been holding her hands. And then we have a question from Alicia as well. Actually, mine is very similar to Alicia's, so um, you could probably tackle them in tandem. But I was wondering what the challenges were of pulling out a traditional folkloric mythical figure from Irish history and sort of bringing it into sort of contemporary Ireland and how it might speak to sort of the Irish world that we have today that's very much a European nation and advocates everything European. So how do you, like how, are there, are there challenge, there must be very big challenges, but how are you going to address sort of bringing some of that Irish tradition forward into a sort of a modern, because you've set them as well in, in modern day as well. So how do you tackle sort of bringing that Irish traditions forward to a nation that perhaps has potentially forgotten about him, this, all this myth? Um, itself. Mm, it's, yeah, it's a really, that's a really good question. I and mean, I think really um, that's something that maybe I'll need to sort of tackle in some senses going forward. Because I've set it in a particular period, um, I suppose I haven't really thought about. The, I think the, the way that the character is presented maybe is speaking to a contemporary audience in terms of how we see um gothic reimaginings of 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 creatures um from folklore happening you know um in it's a sort of phenomenon that's happening at the moment i think in in sort of gothic literature so i think in terms of the way that perhaps the banshee speaks it feels like a more contemporary sort of voice um but i haven't really thought about how i'm addressing um contemporary Ireland that's something that I would have to really think about because I did set it very much in a historical period so yeah that's a really interesting question although a period that nevertheless had started to lose some of its traditions by then it was fighting for a nation but absolutely some of, that, yeah. uh, some so, of those yeah that the ideas of the banshee and, and little people had already more or less fallen by the wayside by then Yes, so, so I can answer that then, because the thing that's interesting about that period of time for me is the Irish literary revival. And so obviously you've got the big figures like W.B. Yeats, who are absolutely fascinated by spirits and fairies, and, and also this idea of the occult as well that becomes quite prominent. Um, and I mean, Yeats is different from other figures within the Irish literary revival in that respect. Um, but I think that sort of Victorian obsession as well with with sort of seances and spiritualism and so on um, is something that really interests me. And that is actually something that will appear in the sort of main uh, narrative of my novel. And uh, for me, the, the fact that that the whole idea is about nation building. So from the sort of 19th century going into the 20th century, as you say, a lot of these traditions had been um, you know, dismantled, really. Um, and uh, people were starting to have to learn, you know, Irish Gaelic again. And there was a whole programme, wasn't there, with the Gaelic League and so on, who, who were really sort of making efforts to, to try and get people to um, learn uh, Irish Gaelic again and start speaking it again. Um, and I think, you know, trying to bring back various different types of um, Irish culture, and some of it seemed seems when we look at it now as an artificial artificial sort of process and i'm sort of seeing the the creation of this um this banshee figure as kind of part of that process almost like an appropriation of folk folk culture in order to sort of nation build 
Um, and there's two sides of that. It can be positive and negative. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of where I'm coming from with it um, a little bit, if that sort of answers your question. Mm, and given voice, perhaps there's a, a link you can make maybe with the revival of the Irish language. Then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there is meant to be, there is actually some, I have actually used some Irish Gaelic in the voice of the Banshee, um, but I don't feel confident enough to speak it. So I don't really <laughs> neither. Saying, I don't feel like I'm authentic enough to do that yet. I'd need to get some advice and help with that. So if anybody knows, um, if anybody can help me with that, that would be brilliant. Um, so one of the ways that I address the historical voices is by pulling excerpts of transcriptions, court records, um, anything that can actually be documented to have been said by the people that I'm writing about. Um, and then I view that through the Gothic lens, which is a more contemporary lens in terms of, you know, the Gothic originating around the 17 and 1800s and so on. Um, and then on top of that, there is a lens from you know, the current time period, um, a literary lens looking at that. And so that creates layers of distortion. And then really, I am transcribing what I see as the distortion into the work. So there, there are different elements that go into trying to capture that historical voice and bring it into the present. Um, I haven't, again, like Esther said, I, I haven't thought too much about how am I going to, you know, align this work with um, what is happening right now in Ireland? Because I'm I'm based in America, so it sounds like a good excuse for a research trip for me, actually. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you both very much. Fabulous. Um, feel free to keep putting your questions in the chat. We'll come to them. I wanted to ask Kirsten a question, actually. Just Esther, when uh, described how um, the story of the Banshee and this creative project kind of arose out of like a family connection with her grandmother going through um, being in Dublin at the time of the Rising. What about Ireland in particular sort of attracted you in terms of its political tensions, its the the things you saw as being need needed to bring to light through your writing? Um, I don't know if my ambitions or aspirations were very lofty at all. <laughs> so one of the few um, documented family lineages I have <clears throat> is great, 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 perhaps, grandparents who came from Ireland in 1849 to America. And I know their names and I know a bit about their story. And so because, you know, my own family history is so, has so many unknowns, I like having that little bit of family lineage and tie. Um, and so it felt a bit more personal for me to want to explore things that I am personally connected to in, in my work as well. Excellent, thank you. That was a good, that was a good answer. Fred, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, no, just, just a question. Alicia, I had a question for you both. Alicia, do you want me to read a question? Do you want to start come and ask it again? Uh, you can go ahead and read it, it's fine. It's all typed out, so I might as well just read it. Absolutely. So a question for both of you, from Alicia. What are, what are some of the challenges in writing a voice for those women, female entities who remain silenced by history and all the stories that define them? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it is quite a challenge, to be honest. Um, I think, I mean, obviously, I'm, I, I think I maybe have an advantage in some ways dealing with a folk a character from folklore because she's already a character so so in a sense she's sort of recognizable in that way and i think because there are so many different sort of iterations of the banshee and many different stories um you know um 
in the kind of records um, and accounts. Um, I think I can draw so much from all of those places um, and sort of synthesize those ideas into the sort of reinvention of this of this figure in a way that's both recognizable as a banshee, but then also um, perhaps has some sort of unique features and, and one of them obviously being this ability to speak and it, and it seems like a sort of contradiction in terms that I should have a figure of a banshee who isn't allowed to speak but I really wanted to explore what she would say if she was able to and I think that's probably the I think that's the thing you know because we we do want to hear what women's histories are but they're so often not written down and we don't we don't have that record i mean yes there are you know with in your case with them um, with the witches record um and kitler i suppose you do have some things to go on but a lot of it sort of becomes you know just having to yeah just having to try and place yourself there and imagine how they would feel i think i quite often start with a feeling what would their emotional experience be like what would it feel like if i was if i was there and it's very difficult for me to imagine what it might be like to be a banshee because <laughs> it's a spectral being, but um, <laughs> but I have tried. Yeah, so I don't know if that's a very effective answer, but that's that's all I've got at the moment, I think. Um, so I'm writing historical figures, but I'm also inventing characters. Uh, to suit specific ideas or time periods. And obviously those invented characters are much easier to write. Um, but I, I sort of take the same approach with the historical ones, which is that I had the seed of an idea or an experience and I have to nurture and grow it into something else. Um, and the, the challenge, I think, with that is not to Im embed so much of myself in it, but to let the voices emerge on their own. Um, and also to, uh, uh, to approach it with an open mind, right? Because we, we want to bring our own uh, experiences and subjectivity to the analysis of the experience and then you know run it through our creative process mill and come out with this predictable product but it's really requiring me to do a lot of listening and to try uh, again to go into those quiet interstitial spaces in the stories and see what I can find and what I can hear so in a sense, it's like place writing, but through through history, uh, the history of the people, I suppose. History seems to be a really strong idea in in both of your works, um, which kind of leads me to the next question. Um, Elle has a really nice compliment in the chat about um, your use of the voice of the Banshee, Esther. So, Good job. Um, but my question kind of bouncing off that would be, how did you come to the stylistic organisation of your novel, the, the nitty gritty, the bolts of putting it together? And how did you negotiate the influences that you're using, either literary and you mentioned Heaney, Esther, and I know, Kirsten, you're using a lot of court documents. How did you negotiate using them but also finding your own patterns within the story you want to tell <laughs> oh gosh yeah i mean it's it's a really strange process i find it a bit like sort of it's percolation so i think what i tend to do is um you know you obviously you'll be reading all the time anyway so everything that you read kind of um, becomes part of you and then it's it can emerge in your creative writing somehow. It's very difficult to describe that process. Um, but I think what I, I'll try to do is immerse myself in various different um, types of writing that I feel maybe speak to what's happening in the novel. Um, so, for example, the bit about this idea of the banshee being a fairy of the mound, that's what banshee means. So the idea of um, her sort of being 
uh, her, her place, uh, her dwelling, if you like, being in this bog land. I just that just that idea really appealed to me. And then that brought me to these bog poems, these wonderful poems that um, Seamus Heaney wrote um, um, about these bodies that are sort of semi-preserved. And um, I thought there was, you know, there's such a gothic quality to that. And um, I really like the sort of um, uh, the sort of visceral descriptions of, of the senses within that. And I just thought actually that really speaks to the idea of the kind of this sort of semi-animalistic kind of um, creature um, that's in my version of the Banshee. The fact that she does shapeshift, that she does change from old woman into young woman into a bird, for example. So it sort of allows me to access that. So obviously I'm not sort of, <laughs> I'm not stealing in a really obvious way, but I'm just sort of letting those ideas percolate through. And then in, in a few days or maybe straight away or maybe in a month's time, something comes out on the page, which is like, has been inspired by that. But I wouldn't say from my pers personal way of writing, I don't think it's a very conscious process. I think it's almost, well, what they call the back brain. Um, you're accessing your back brain. So you're feeding in lots of information, it's a lot of input but then you can't force it to become something. So then you perhaps ask a question and then start writing and see what comes out. And, and sometimes it's utter rubbish and other times it's, you know, it can, it can work. So I think that's my process, but it's not very, um, it's not particularly structured, I, I wouldn't say. So I, I personally have more of an issue with, with the nuts and bolts and plotting and structuring and all of that kind of thing is very difficult for me and very challenging for me. Um, but finding voice I find interesting. Kate, would you repeat your question for me? Yes, of course. It was more about how you organise the work, how you came to you. I think you said yours is 26 chapters and they're organized in terms of time how did you come to the the sort of structural organization of the work and are you still fiddling with it do you think you've got it down <laughs> um so it originally started with uh the the concept at the core of this is um an idea from hinduism that karma accretes as a physical substance in the body from uh, reincarnation to reincarnation. So I started thinking about the life of the karma, really, and the karma as an extant being, right? So you might think about it as a soul. And what is the soul taking with it into each uh, reincarnated life? And so that let me led me to envisioning all of these different women to make it manageable it's organized chronologically and so that we can see the emergence of certain trends in the in the subject material um and that's pretty much what i've done so yeah there's 21 chapters each of a different person in a different era and then the commonality is that karmic soul and the energy that's carried between them. Brilliant, thank you. I think, oh, we've got five minutes, but there's a sneaky question been chucked in the chat for Esther. So Oliver says, your description and depiction of the Banshee closely tied it to animals and the natural world. Uh, does your writing speak to any notable environmental concerns with the narrative carrying over an extended period and links to imperialism? It seems an ideal theme to incorporate. Wow. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. That's a great <laughs> idea. I'll have that one. <laughs> um, I don't. Yeah, I don't think so. Not particularly, although I do explore various different sort of um, happenings in sort of um, I suppose rural places and, and, and bog lands and areas, sort of rural Ireland. I mean, there's a section which is I called Wolfland, which is 
uh, Ireland was overrun with wolves at one point, um, which I found really brilliant. And I thought that the, well, obviously it wasn't brilliant at the time, but um, I, I liked the concept of that. So the fact that the Banshee might be able to run with these wolves as well, um, uh, I found really fascinating. So um, it does sort of engage with um, different places, I suppose. So there is a kind of um, place orientation but um, I can't say that I have actually thought about sort of comments, environmental comments, but if, if that's something that maybe does seem to come, be drawn out of what I'm writing, then that's, that's really interesting. So um, thank you for that. Yeah, I will, um, I'll have a think a bit more about that. Fabulous. We have three minutes until the end of this chat. <laughs> So it's probably quite a good time to say thank you so much, both of you, for coming on. Uh, Kirsten, it is ungodly early for you, bless. So thank you very much, even with the time difference. But it's been so interesting hearing about your creative process and your ideas. And I hope you're going to celebrate St. Patrick's Day in a manner befitting the day. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Definitely. Need a drink now. Oh, fabulous. Great idea. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. All right. So just to the end, Ali, if you want to come on and give us our closer, tie everything up with a beautiful bow and we'll bid everybody good evening. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank both, both of our speakers uh, for the wonderful talks on Irish Gothic. I think it's really great to have perspectives from writers of the Gothic as well as researchers. Uh, just a reminder that there is a YouTube channel attached to the Mentors Centre for Gothic Studies. So all of our talks uh, will be posted onto there and the link is in the chat and it might be put again in the chat so you guys can have, have a look. Um, the discount code for Mentors University Press is also in the chat. So have a look at their Gothic titles. Um, our next session is the 21st of April on Gothic or Cultures. And that's from 5.30 to 7. So we all like we invite you all to come and um, be our audience for that as well. Um, please uh, join us for these kind of events moving forward as well. It's a really good way to see what's happening at the Gothic Centre and with postgraduate researchers we have. And uh, if you have any questions and queries, uh, please get in contact with us at mmugothicapproaches at gmail.com. We can, we're happy to answer any concerns and um, if you have any questions for speakers, we can always pass those on as well. And thank you all for coming. Oh, and happy, uh, happy Patrick, St. Patrick's Day as well to everyone. Happy St. Patrick's Day, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, thank everyone. You. <laughs> and thank you very much, Kirsten and Esther. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Happy St. Pat's. Enjoy bye. the rest of the day. Yeah, take care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. I don't always mention that life, Alicia. It's all I can see. I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't apologize.